What is up, everyone? Welcome back to The Bear Report. Today, we're going to take a look at another company caught in the AI hype, and that's Upstart. We believe that the company may have bigger problems than what many think. But before we dive into Upstart, if you enjoy this content, like this video, and go ahead and give us a subscribe so you can stay up to date on all our future content. One of the first things we are going to get into is management. And what I mean by this, we will take a look at the lack of transparency and questionable decisions that the executive team has made. Then we will dive into the core business and discuss the ways management decided to change their business model by financing loans on their balance sheet and why we believe there may be fundamental flaws in the Upstart software. Before we get into our building blocks and what makes our bear thesis here on the company, I think we need to understand what the company does first thoroughly so we can better understand what the ultimate bear thesis is because it heavily evolves around the core business. Upstart is a cloud-based AI lending platform operating essentially as an enterprise software company. So what happens is borrowers can apply for a loan online, usually through their primary funnel via upstart.com, and the company uses data science and AI algorithms, including target fee optimization, education, employment, um, income fraud, acquisition targeting, and much more. These models are provided to banks issuing upstart-powered loans as cloud applications, and they are ultimately used to determine whether to approve the loans and what the interest rate will be. As of Q3 2023, 88% of their loan approvals were fully automated, which is phenomenal since that's part of their primary goal. And the loans upstart specializes in really only ranges from $1,000 to $50,000, with repayment terms typically spanning between three in five years. So basically, the best way to think about what this company does is think about it as an AI based lending marketplace that connects consumers with lenders. Upstart's mission is to make the lending process fully autonomous and frictionless, along with throwing out our traditional ways of lending. The company is challenging the traditional method through FICO scores, which has been the guiding light for credit decisions in the US for almost five decades now. Upstart views the FICO score-based credit decision-making process as fundamentally limited. So what they are doing is plowing ahead with its approach of making decisions based on a wide range of data points, data science, with the process guided by sophisticated AI machine learning algorithms. And it needs to be noted that the company actually does not do the lending, and Upstart supposedly has limited credit risk since the company can use its balance sheet in quotations, limited circumstances, such as to jumpstart new lending programs like their HELOC product, just which just launched, collect data, perform analysis, and iterate until it is ready for use by its banking partners. Upstart makes money through fees paid by its bank and credit union partners. So for example, Loans that originate through their primary funnel via upstart.com, banks will pay a referral fee. This process is, I guess it's very similar to how you would say mortgage brokers get, get paid. And for all loans, Upstart charges a platform fee. And this platform fee comes in only if those partners are utilizing the Upstart platform as well. Then for loans retained by banks or held by Upstart's pool of institutional investors, Upstart charges a servicing fee as the loan is repaid by the consumer. And this is what the table below shows. It shows the, uh, the breakdown of these fees for a typical Upstart loan. As of Q3 2023, the company had just over 100 partners under their belt. However, the issue with all of this is their entire process has changed when they decided to start financing loans on their balance sheet rapidly. Uh, which will lead us and is a building block to the bear thesis on this company. But before we jump into management, I just wanted to show Upstart stock performance from IPO until current today. This company really hit it out of the park from IPO until all-time highs, becoming a $4 billion run rate business at the end of 2021. The business became very popular in the mainstream media, gaining tons of traction for its incredible AI-based platform. But however, then rapidly increasing inflation started to enter the picture along with rapidly increasing interest rates in the macro 
picture, the macroeconomic picture, um, started to become more and more sour for them. This ultimately led to Upstart's horrendous fall right here, as you can see, which also happened to be a historic bear market as well, which a lot of people just want to forget about. It was not a good year at all. But Upstart was such a new and unsupported technology trying to disrupt our traditional methods of FICO. Banks and credit unions started to pause services due, uh, upstart services due to tough macro and constrained, uh, a constrained lending environment. I'm not sure if this is the right word, but I guess you could say they were skeptical if they continue to use their platform and if the economy was going to slip into a potential recession. And you know, since this is a very new innovative way of lending and the business is extremely cyclical being tied directly to the health of the economy and interest rates, it makes Upstart look more of as a risk than an asset to these partners. But ultimately, we believe that the depressed levels for this company stock, that the stock trades today and has been trading for quite some time now, which it's kind of volatile, it's warranted. We will get into this more in depth later, but we didn't have enough data to know whether or not this platform is truly better than our traditional ways of lending. Now that we see a much clearer macro and direct competitors to Upstart are setting rec record revenues and Upstart is sandbagging and having a, a really difficult time reaching expectations and with the lack of transparency with management and their decision making, we really suspect that there may be fundamental flaws in their software, which warrants this overall decline and current depressed levels. And we will get into why we believe there may be flaws in their platform. Now, the first thing I want to get into is management. We're going to take a look at their insider selling and buying, then break down the lack of transparency to shareholders. Right here, we have the CEO and co-founder of Upstart, Dave Gerard. This shows how many shares he had at IPO and how many he has today as the last transaction date and how many shares Dave has sold since IPO. And as seen here, Dave had a 17.7% stake in the company upon the time of IPO, which equated to just over 13 million shares. On the S1 prospectus, it says he had over a 20% but he exercised an offering once they IPO'd that released and sold 1 million of his shares. So we are using the 17.7 stake. Now, as the last transaction date on November 21st, he had a total of 72,028 shares under his direct ownership. He now has a whopping 0.08% stake in the company. If you are a long-term shareholder, this should be seen as concerning in our opinion. Usually companies that talk the talk about their company will walk the walk by preserving and buying more shares of the business because their future is bright. But in this context, it's the opposite. The selling with the CEO and management is very similar to Palantir, actually, uh, which we discussed in our last video. But at the time of IPO to last transaction, Dave sold nearly 13 million shares, which was nearly 100% of his position. I mean, the actual number, I believe, is around 99 percent uh, I mean uh, it's almost 100 percent of his position the amount worth that he sold was just over 226 million dollars worth and to top it off the CEO has never bought a single share directly on the open market in this next slide to give you a visual this is a chart of Dave's direct buying and selling into IPO on December 16th of 2020 until today and as seen here you have the IPO date on the left and then we have the parabolic rise in upstart stock price that reached all-time highs to close to around $400 per share, which Dave started to unload his stake in the company. Then on the way down, the CEO decides to unload the rest of his stake above $100 per share. I say the rest of his stake. He still has a position, but nearly 99% of that stake was sold. And as you go further down upstart's price history here, where we hit historic lows, Dave still isn't a buyer. And this is very concerning to me since the company always touts their total addressable market and the vision on where they're going to be in the future with their platform. 
but there has been no buying from the leader of this company. It's also important to note that the CEO has been exercising options during this time period. Then as they vest, he is also dumping most of those shares. Uh, not all, but most, unfortunately. Then this box up here is showing the current direct ownership Dave has in the business. It depicts 72,030 shares, but that's because Ortex, the software I use for this, tracks everything in real time and round up the two single shares. It shows he has a 0.08% direct stake in the company as of his last transaction as well. I also put this quote up by Peter Lynch because it's the truth and I agree with it because this is what many bulls always love to point to on insider selling, but it only applies in this context if there is also buying. In this next slide, we have a visual of the entire management team directly buying and selling on the open market from IPO until current which does include the board of directors as well. As seen in this illustration, we have a mirroring perspective of Dave selling patterns with the management team. As the stock had its historic run up, most of the executives and directors sold at all time highs. This is when most of the insider ownership of the company took a major decline because the team wanted to sell at these levels. And like we said about Palantir, bulls go on to say, well, if you had a significant stake, in the company that went to go on to set all-time highs, you would sell some of that stake too. Well, yes, that's correct. I think 99% of people would likely say yes to that. However, you don't exit the majority of your stakes if you believe in such a great vision and future of this company, then continue to sell at lows. Otherwise, your actions are clearly not aligning with your, your words. But this trend continues on the way down from all-time highs too. And the most concerning part about all this insider selling is when it was being done. So if you look at where Upstart was in historic all-time lows, we see the most insider selling transactions in the company's price history. And I put this question up here because it's warranted. You know, why are we really selling at all-time lows and not buying? And when we look at the insider momentum for the last 12 months, there have been 77 total transactions to sell worth just over $9 million, and there was only one transaction to buy with not much significance or weight attached to it. I know you're probably unable to see it here since the selling overwhelms the screen, but there was one insider buy from a board of director, and we will get into this in our next slide. Carrie Cooper is the only person from this executive team and board to actually buy shares directly on the open market in the company's history of being public. However, which I labeled here, she did join in March of 2021, so she wasn't with Upstart upon IPO. As of her last transaction date, she had just under 6,000 shares, so I wouldn't really put too much significance on her insider activity, but she was the only one that did buy. I want to now get into management's lack of transparency and their decision-making. And the first and the most concerning is when management decided to start financing loans on their balance sheet after they said they weren't going to get involved with this side of the lending business. Unfortunately, they did. And I don't want to call anybody a liar, but clearly management did lie to shareholders on this specific topic. And it's not like this was a minor change to their business. It was a major one. And it was a decision that changes your entire business model. Now acting as a, a chartered bank in a way. And we will get into more specifically about this with our core business segment. And I will show everyone in the next slide where and when they lied about it. But this falls under management transparency and poor decision making. Uh, so we wanted to go over this and we give it a red flag. Now, something that most investors on the both bear and bull side overlooked was when management randomly and suddenly just eliminated their revenue illustrations from their Q2 2023 earnings uh, presentation then decided to go back and even take out their Q1 2023 revenue illustration. And we will show you what we are talking about in the next couple slides, but we give this a yellow flag for management. And very similar to how revenue graphs went overlooked, but management made another mistake by using the wrong dates for their default rates in their Q3 2023 earnings presentation. After an hour of reaching their results in presentation to the public, they went back and changed the error but we will show you exactly what we are talking about in the next couple slides, but we also put this under management and give this one a yellow flag. 
Here are the statements made by management in the Q4 2021 earnings call transcript regarding the topic of taking loans on their balance sheet. By not getting directly involved in the securitization markets in the context of also heavily financing these loans. Sanjay Dada, uh, he's the CFO, I'm, hopefully I'm saying his name right, uh, clearly states here they don't directly get involved in this segment of the business. Then when we fast forward to Q1 2022 earnings call transcript, we have remarks in the Q&A section about how Upstart decided to take loans on their balance sheet beyond their intention. Now, there is much more context to this, but I wanted to give you a visual to solidify the bear case on management. So it, I would heavily advise going back to these transcripts and reading them for yourselves. And I will be getting much more in depth with this later in the core business, but I wanted to show you the lack of transparency and decision-making by this management team. What you're looking at here are revenue graphs Upstart used to use in their earnings presentation. The left shows the quarter over quarter, then on the right shows the year over year. And you're probably asking, why are you showing me this? Well, that's because Upstart stopped implementing these as of Q2 2023. Then the company decided to go back and to the Q1 2023 earnings presentation and take that chart out as well. So my question to, to this is, why would management do this? You know, what are they trying to hide? We already know their results are abysmal. So there's no need to be like embarrassed with their performance. We know how bad it's going to be. But the fact that you not only stopped implementing them, but you went back and eliminated the previous graphs makes no sense to me. I mean, you're really sending a signal that you don't want your shareholders to see the decline in revenue, which we already knew is not good. I don't think many bulls or bears caught this, but it's usually not a good signal by management. It really impacts your transparency as a team. Now, what we are looking at are the default rates from Q1 2023 and Q2 2023 left to right. This is another mistake management made that impacts their transparency. So Upstart discloses their default rates in comparison to FICO on every earnings presentation in these charts. And here, highlighted in red, the dates are always changed for the corresponding quarter to show up-to-date data and accuracy. And if you look closely, each quarter has different inputs for risk grades and credit score. However, when we go ahead and take a look at their Q3 2023 earnings presentation, I caught something that they they made an error with updating the date for their, their presentation. It depicts the Q2 2023 default rates data. So at first, I was like, oh no, are they covering up the ballooning default rates? Then I looked closely and the data for risk grades and credit score was different than the Q2 2023 data. So it looks like they just forgot to update the date in the presentation, which... I mean, it's not good. It's not a good look as a subprime lender. When they released this to the public after hours, the company did notice the mistake and they changed it to the corresponding uh, quarter. Many bulls will think these minor issues aren't a big deal. But when we combine that with how the company has performed in previous mishaps, this really points to overall poor management decisions and a lack of transparency. And I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but this is the CEO um, of Upstart on Twitter, uh, or now X. He sent this tweet before the Q3 2023 earnings results, which was overall not a good quarter at all with investor expectations improving. But, you know, this is a pretty distasteful thing like to say after the poor performances and the decisions the company has made over the past couple of years. Comments like this made to the public on social platforms, and this was a lowball comment, and I think it was directed at long-term bulls. Finally, we will be getting to the core business where we will take a look at the company's financial statements, loans on their balance sheet, and lastly, what we believe may be fundamental flaws in their software. So I want to start out by looking over Upstart's financial statements, and this is the company's profit and loss statement. As you can see here, I had to go ahead and input additional data myself in both the quarter over quarter and year over year percentage increases and decreases columns. I'm really not sure why management started to do this three quarters ago. 
My guess is they don't want to keep reiterating to shareholders how bad their results are, but I went ahead and inputted the actual data so we have a clear and better understanding. Revenue was down 1% Q over Q, but down 14% uh, year over year, and revenue from fees was actually up 2% uh, quarter over quarter, uh, but also down 18% year over year. The company is also operating at a large loss at the moment and have been for almost two years now. Year over year, it has increased, but the Q over Q growth is atrocious. The same thing with the earnings per share, up year over year, but I mean, goodness, the the quarter over quarter decline is just not a good sign. Two of the most important metrics with this business lie in the contribution margin and profit. Margin was up year over year, but down quarter over quarter. Then when looking at profit, it has declined quarter over quarter and year over year, which signals distress. On top of all this, operating expenses increased quarter over quarter. You know, many bulls like to point to a difficult lending environment and macro, but that's not even close to to accurate when you're when you look at the overall economy for 2023. Consumer spending is very strong, unemployment is steady, inflation is coming down, and all while your direct competitors are setting record revenues and exceeding expectations for three consecutive quarters. Meanwhile, Upstart can't even meet guidance, expectations, operating at a loss. So it's not valid anymore for bulls or management to emphasize economic headwinds. I mean, that ship has kind of sailed. This is the company's balance sheet. I have another slide that goes over their loans held on their balance sheet next, which is one of those building blocks to our bear thesis. When we look at their cash reserves, it is down year over year, but actually up quarter over quarter, surprisingly. The increase is due to... Uh, part of an ABS sale and other financing related activities. There's also consistent growth in loans notes and residuals, both Q over Q and uh, year over year. This was due to an expansion in lending activities, which is true. Assets are up as well, but liabilities are up significantly. And this is due to the issue with loans on their balance sheet, which we will get into. Then for both transaction volume of loans and dollars, they are both in distress, especially when you compare this to their, their average when they're, they were a $4 billion run rate business. And lastly, a major part of what their mission is, the percentage of loans that were fully automated rose to 88%. This is pretty impressive. Um, however, it's less impressive when you are operating at a significant loss in a strong economy and have flaws in your software. The, the company does kind of show signs of growth in its core lending activities, but the reduced number of loans and transaction volume compared to the same period last year and when Upstart was operating at a profit are, are areas of concern, potentially indicating um, which, I mean, I believe are is a more competitive market. Uh, some will say changing market conditions like high interest rates, uh, Pagaya Technologies, their direct competitor, or what we believe a combination of these factors, including a flawed software. Now we get to what's plaguing this business, and that's when they suddenly changed their business model after they said they weren't, then went ahead and started taking loans on their balance sheet. One thing that needs to be cleared up, though, because I don't think most bulls or bears even know, but since Upstart was operating as a private company, IPO launch, and until today, the company has always said they would utilize their balance sheet with loans um, under, and I quote, limited circumstances for R&D purposes. So what this means is when Upstart launches a new product like their HELOC uh, pilot they are doing now, this is when they would take loans in their balance sheet under limited circumstances so they can get data and test it. However, the company has clearly steered away uh, far away from the word limited and essentially started taking loans on their balance sheet for all products significantly after they said they would never do this. Now Upstart has transitioned away from operating as a platform business to ultimately a chartered bank, changing the entire business model, which we know. But I wanted to clarify this for everyone so loans on the balance sheet isn't over, overly exaggerated. So when we look at their R&D here, it has been relatively stable and this should be expected 
as they test and expand new products. However, again, when we look at all their products and loans under them, they have consistently increased as, as seen on, on uh, total on balance sheet. The 196 million ABS sale highlighted here, they had to include, so actual loans in the balance sheet is $776 million, not technically that $972 million. They had to include this on their balance sheet, even though it has already been sold by law. That said, whether we use total whole loans or total on balance sheet, it doesn't really matter. The inconsistency of the ABS sales shouldn't be excluded in our bear thesis, since this is not normal for them. I mean, what if those loans never sold? This question in itself is why we're using this 972 uh, number here. But when we look at the big picture with them now directly involved in the securitization markets, financing loans, and poor operational uh, performance, this isn't sustainable over the long term. Now, after what I've just explained, bulls will point to the $4 billion Castle Lake deal. I mean, this is no doubt good news for the company and bulls but they fail to see the long-term future with their current operations. The increase in cash reserves due to the ABS deal is a positive sign. The key question is how sustainable Upstart's new financial model is in the long term, especially if ABS deals are not consistently available. While the current cash position seems kind of strong, the ongoing losses raise concerns about the long-term uh, sustainability. If these losses continue with a significant increase in, in in revenue or other income sources, Upstart might face uh, cash flow challenges in the future. And this is without even mentioning their flaws in their software too. So while the agreement with Castle Lake is a positive sign for Upstart, the company needs to address its ongoing losses, ensure that its growth strategies are sustainable in the long term. Um, the, the management of external dependencies like Castle Lake, uh, market conditions right now, operational scalability, and the regulatory compliance is crucial for this company. Lastly, we get to where we suspect that Upstart has fundamental flaws in their cloud-based AI software. So what we have here is three consecutive quarter highlights with both Upstart and Upstart's direct competitor, Pagaya Technologies. And before I even get into this, I want to say that I am not a Pagaya bull at all. I'm simply using this as a template to compare and contrast both companies. When we do compare both of these companies coming out of a difficult 2022 with inflation and an int introduction to high interest rates, and technically where we had our recession, Upstart has significantly struggled while its competitor has been absolutely knocking out of the park. Looking at Upstart's Q1 2023, it was their worst quarter, not meeting guidance and operating at a significant loss. Meanwhile, Pagaya's Q1 2023, they not only exceeded guidance on all metrics, but they returned to a positive EBITDA. As time went on, Upstart's Q2 2023 was slightly better from the previous, but still struggling to turn a profit. Uh, Pagaya, on the other hand, received record revenue, or sorry, record network volume on their platform, beat guidance, and grew EBITDA by nearly 255%. I think it's actually a little higher than that. Now, for Upstart's Q3 2023 report, it declined from the previous quarter, operating at a deeper loss. Then, Pagaya's Q3 2023 set record revenues, and raised their guidance. On top of Pagaya being the, the clear winner for performance, they have been landing more and higher quality bank partners and credit unions just recently, um, I believe a couple weeks ago, landing a top five bank in the U.S. You know, at first, I didn't think much about the first quarter comparison back when the results were released because we were indeed coming out of an unclear economic in lending environment with interest rates. However, the second quarter for both companies, it began to kind of catch my eye that there may be a free-for-all on who is the more dominant platform because it used to be Upstart. Then when the third quarter came around, I knew there was a bigger problem and that points to fundamental flaws in Upstart's platform. It explains the business model change, insider selling, lack of transparency, 
Pagaya outperforming and taking market share and ultimately issues with their their software. It seems that, and it clearly shows in their financial statements and when we compare Pagaya, that Upstart's AI models aren't calibrated or as efficient in our new economic climate with high interest rates. And there is also no excuse for your direct competitor to be absolutely killing it for three straight quarters, setting record numbers, um, and you are failing to reach expectations and make a profit. Bulls will say, well, it's not a winner-takes-all market. And I 100% agree with this. I picture this market like a Visa and MasterCard situation, two businesses that offer relatively the same services and can coexist. However... (laughs) This does not apply if there is an obvious and more efficient platform, in this case, Pagaya. If I'm a bank or a credit union and Upstart has issues with their uh, their platform, which translates over into their performance, why would I use them and not Pagaya? You want optimal performance, not mediocre. I don't want to go too deep in this, but I found this interesting. When Upstart had its horrible decline, as many companies did in our, our bear market, Law firms started to come out introducing lawsuits for shareholders to recover money from losses. And I take these with a grain of salt uh, because they happen all the time. 99% of them are essentially meaningless. However, I believe this one has merit considering we just went over how their software is likely flawed. So I just wanted to put this out here because I thought it was pretty interesting. And this gets us to our ultimate bear case on this company, which we believe that there are flaws in their revolutionary cloud-based AI software. When we take a look at insider selling and how the entire management team hasn't bought a single share on the open market with the exception of a board member, most of their sales being done at all-time highs, it really points to concerns with how the management team sees the future of the business. Also with the lack of transparency by the management team, eliminating critical revenue illustrations and miscalculating and dating graphs then essentially lying to shareholders about a major change to the company's business model about taking loans in their balance sheet really questions the governance at this company. Then when we dive into the company's financial statements and performance, comparing it to its, uh, its direct competitors in a resilient economy with high interest rates, it's clear that Upstart is not only having major issues producing a profit or scaling at a sustainable pace to justify their new business model, but it shows there may be fundamental flaws in the company's software. So that is it for this video. If you enjoyed it, give us a like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on our future content. Our next video will be on a medical device company that is supposedly changing the way we do medical imaging. So stay tuned. Also in the comments, let us know if you have any suggestions for future videos. Thanks for watching.